just in time for Halloween, kind of, this is a case that was solved partially by a witch. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> 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 oh, God, I never do that again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, by a witch. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Martha Brailsford. Viewer discretion is advised. Real quick before we get started, hello, I'm Mike. If you're new here, I tell true crime stories three days a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays here on YouTube. I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. I used to have 3 million followers over there until TikTok banned me. But I do have a kind of new page, uh, which will be linked in the link tree in the description of this video below. I also sell merch, which is also in the link tree. We ship internationally, and I also have a Discord server. Feel free to join, but be over the age of 18 or else you're going to get the boot and get kicked out of there. Sorry, not sorry. Anyway, let's start with today's case. Martha Brailsford was born on May 8th, 1954 in Hackensack, New Jersey. Hey, that's where the Chucky movies start or take place, right? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Even though she was born in New Jersey, it sounds like her family would kind of bounce around a lot. She lived for quite some time in Cleveland. She also lived for some time in Chicago. She went on to earn her associate's degree from Endicott College, and then later got her bachelor's degree in German from Boston University. She would then meet her husband, Brian, and they had a relatively happy marriage, as far as I could tell, nothing out of the ordinary. I don't see any records, though, of them having any children. She herself was one of four kids. She had two sisters and a brother. Martha would, at the time of the story, operate a, a business, or a, a fashion enterprise, which uh, was called Uncommon Threads, and she developed her own interior design firm. She was doing really well for herself. They lived in Marblehead, Massachusetts, but as this case occurs, they were living in the Salem, Massachusetts area. Yes, that Salem, Massachusetts, which is well known for its history of witches, the Salem Witch Trials, an area of the country that is just rooted in history. Not exactly the best of history, but history all the same. And later on in the story, a witch will factor into it. It was July 12th, 1991. Martha's husband, Brian, who was, I guess, a captain for a cruise ship company, he arrived home that afternoon to find that Martha wasn't home. He noticed uh, basically because she, I guess, had artwork outside that she would always bring in um, by the evening time, but her artwork was still outside and nothing about the inside of the house indicated that she had even been there for several hours. And this kind of concerned him. So he, it was nighttime by the time he got home, he began searching the neighborhood with a flashlight, asking neighbors. He wanted to ask one of their neighbors, Thomas Maimoni, um, if he had seen her because I guess Martha and Thomas would do walks together every morning or almost every morning. But when he knocked on Thomas's door, no one answered. And so he went back to Thomas's house the next morning, right at the crack of dawn, knocked on his door again. He still wasn't answering. No one was there, it seems. So at this point, he reports his wife missing. And it sounds like police were maybe a little hesitant at first to take this seriously because, again, she is an adult woman, but they still took the report. Um, now, Brian had gone to, I guess, the local yacht club, Palmer's Cove Yacht Club, I believe was the name, uh, where he knew that Thomas Maimoni had his own little sailing ship and maybe he could find him there to see if he knew where Martha was. He got to the, the area and saw Thomas's boat, which was called the Counterpoint. And he looked around the docks, he looked around the area, he couldn't find Thomas. And so he goes back to the, their neighborhood and then he knocks on Thomas's door again and Thomas finally answers the door. Brian and Thomas Maimoni really didn't know each other. Um, they barely ever interacted. 
And he just knew that he was someone that Martha had walked, you know, in the mornings with. He says that, yes, he went for a walk with her the morning that she apparently would have gone missing. And by the end of the walk, she seemed fine and they both parted ways. He went back to his place. She went back to hers. Brian, again, knew about, you know, that this neighbor had a, a sailboat. And so he asked him, like, well, did you by chance, like, just be honest with me, did you go sailing with her? Did you take her sailing? He said, no, he, she was not on my sailboat. He said himself, I haven't even been on my sailboat at all. I, he tells Brian, but listen, you know, you know, when Martha comes home, wherever she is, uh, if you and her want to go sailing with me and I'll, I'll, you know, get a girlfriend, we can go sailing together when she comes home. So yay, plan. And then he told Brian, but I will, in the meantime, I will pray for Martha. But when Brian goes to police and they finally, you know, begin the investigation process of this, because again, she is not home. She is not anywhere. They will talk to Thomas Maimoni. And he says pretty much the same thing he tells Brian at first. Like, I saw her around seven o'clock in the morning. We went for a walk. We were done. We went our separate ways. And that was it. They ask him, did you go sailing with her? He says, I did not go sailing with her. He says that he has a wife and it wouldn't look good, which is interesting because he had told Brian, hey, if you guys want to go, you know, sailing, you and Martha, you know, I'll find a girlfriend. I'm with, what? I, you Now you're married? Police find out through witnesses at the near, at the yacht club, I guess at one of the uh, Willows Pier specifically. Witnesses said they saw Martha boarding the counterpoint, the boat, Thomas Maimoni's boat, with Thomas at 1 p.m. on July 12th, 1991, the day in question, the day she disappeared. Okay. So on July 15th, they bring Thomas in for questioning after getting this information. They read him his rights and they told him like, listen, if you're gonna sit here and tell us that Martha didn't get onto your boat, the counterpoint on that afternoon, then you can just walk out of here. But then they said to him, but if you wanna tell us the truth, have a seat and tell us the truth. And that's when he says she was supposed to bring her husband with her. He says he and Martha made plans for her to meet him at the pier at 1 p.m. And I guess she was going to bring her resume with her and discuss it with him. He says at that time the pier was crowded when Martha arrived and he had brought his boat, I guess, to the Willows Pier, but there was nowhere for him to like rope it off or dock it. And so she, he said at that point, because it was so crowded and because he couldn't stop anywhere, she just jumped on, jumped aboard the, the sailing ship. He then says that he took the boat to Winter Island, which is a part of Willows in the area. And he said at that point, that's when she went ashore. And then he went back to the yacht club where he moored. And this is now about 6 p.m. And then he went home. Which is interesting because Brian had knocked on his door later that evening and he didn't answer. He didn't appear to be home. So this is when detectives, they go to, because Martha, by the way, still hasn't been found. There's no sign of her anywhere, no traces of her. So they go to Winter Island where they, where Thomas says he had dropped Martha off. They're hoping they can find witnesses who may have seen her, this, so they can confirm. One of the people they questioned was actually Martha's dentist who was at that, that Winter Island all the time. Uh, and he was there from 2 p.m. that afternoon until early in the evening, right there where the boats would have, you know, docked. And he said, I did not see Martha at all. You know, I, you know, I would have recognized her. I knew her. She's my patient. She wasn't there. I didn't see her. And they found other witnesses who said, who, you know, they showed photos of Martha. And they're like, I don't recall seeing her ever. They bring Thomas Maimoni back in for questioning. They now tell him, well, we have testimony from a couple people, but namely this dentist that says that Martha never got on, never got off your boat at Winter Island. And they just flat out told him, we don't believe your story. We feel you're, you're lying about something. This is when Thomas gives them another totally different story. Now he says Martha was on his little boat and they went out as far as Gloucester and it was getting close to sunsets. 
He says he was then preparing the boat in order to return back to Salem. And Martha, he says, was trying to help with the boat and get stuff you know, ready and done. This is when he said a rogue wave struck the boat. Her face hit the mast. She grabbed for the head sail, but then went overboard. He said that she has was down and drowned before he could find her. He said he got so scared that he didn't call the Coast Guard. He just went back and that was it. But he told them where this occurred to see if they could maybe find her body. He even said, I'll take you to that area. He said he was scared to come forward with the story because his wife, Patricia, so I guess he does have a wife. Um, I'm not sure why he talked about this girlfriend earlier with Brian. It's a very, he's, he seems to lie about everything. Um, but he didn't want, he was afraid because then his wife would find out that, because his wife was supposedly out of town, um, that you know he had this woman on board by just the two of them and she would freak out. However, when they go to that area, they don't find her. And so this is when one of the detectives does something interesting. Uh, he reaches out to a known local psychic slash witch, Lori Cabot. Lori Cabot is a well-known um, person around Salem. She had a, a shop called The Witch Shop, which she had opened in 1970. In 1977, Michael Dukakis, who was the governor uh, at the time, would name her Salem's official witch. But this time was the first time that she actually helped police in an actual, like, potential murder investigation. So when this detective called, because uh, I guess they were just desperate for any kind of information since Thomas wasn't being forthcoming and they don't, they still haven't found her. And so she says, all right, just give me her name. When was she born? Where did she live? And that's all they provided to her. And she says she goes into this relaxed state called the alpha state. And she gets this, apparently, very clear, vivid vision of what occurred. So she has this vision where Martha is on this ship, this boat, boat ship. I never know what to call them. She's there with a gentleman. She describes Martha as looking very naive, that Martha was trying to like just enjoy just being out on the ocean and taking in the breeze and the beautiful weather. And that suddenly this man tried to make advances on her like sexual advances. She says in this vision, the two, you know, Martha and this man, Thomas Maimoni, they got into an argument and Thomas turned into a beast. Martha was seen in the vision, um, you know, screaming at him to take her back to shore, but he grabbed her and he shook her and he was like fighting her. He then picks up a solid item off the, you know, off the ground and he smashes it over her head. She then falls to the floor and he ties an anchor around her ankle and puts a weight belt on her or around her and then dumps her overboard. Lori Cabot said that Martha's body was still anchored in the water. And this was, she described it in an, a small offshore, like offshore of an island that had a lighthouse. And then unbelievably, on July 18th, 1991. This is literally like five or six hours after Lori Cabot's vision and her telling the story. A body is found by a, a lobster fisherman. One of his traps had an anchor stuck in it. And then he pulled on the anchor and it was like, it was on this long, like a long rope. At the end of that line was a body. It was confirmed to be Martha Brailsford. She was nude. And the autopsy determined that she in fact drowned. She had water in her lungs. They did confirm that she also had at least two or three blunt force trauma injuries to her head. But those didn't kill her, which means that when she was put into the water with the anchor tied around her, she was still alive. But unbelievably, everything that Lori Cabot said was true. She was found with an anchor tied around specifically her ankle. She also said that she would have a weight belt around her waist. She did. She said she would be nude. She was. She said she had was hit over the head a couple of times. She was. She was found by um, uh, off a off a coast, 
with a lighthouse that you can see. By the time this makes news, um, Thomas Maimoni, by the way, has not actually been arrested. He's only been brought in for questioning a couple of times, but they don't have evidence to actually arrest him yet. When the body is found, he flees. So they issue an arrest warrant for him and they begin the search for him because at this point they now know that this was murder. So they go to Lori Cabot again. Hey, can you do, can you look into this however you do and find, and find him? And she says that there is, she has a vision of him looking in a mirror. He's shaving off his facial hair and he looks really frantic. He looks lost. He doesn't seem to know what he wants to do. <laughs> she... Lori Cabot then says, hey, listen, I can probably make him do something stupid if you want me to. And so she makes a, a doll that she calls him, Tom Maimoni, and she wraps it in a cord and she goes into her alpha state again. And I, I guess she has this vision of like a cabin. And lo, lo and behold, they get a call from people in Maine that they found Thomas Maimoni inside of a cabin and he had broken into that cabin and fell asleep on the couch arguably something stupid <laughs> and so they they apprehended him there and then they got in contact with the police in massachusetts and they they brought him back and they formally placed murder charges on him he was trying to flee to canada as he was arrested i guess he was heard saying i killed a woman in massachusetts so he's charged with her murder and he goes to trial and he still swears by his innocence. He says that, and he still stands by this, that she was knocked overboard because of she was hit um, in the face. And that, but now this time he's saying he actually ended up put pulling her back into the boat that she didn't, I guess, drown then. He looks at her and realizes how badly injured she is. And so he says he panics. And then he ties the anchor around her ankle, puts the weight belt on her, and pushes her back in the ocean. And then they ask him, well, how do you explain the blows to her head? Um, because this was multiple blows, not just one strike of a hitting her face on the mast. And they were also to the back of her head, but he said she was hit in the face. He says, well, the lobster guy must have done that somehow. He must have hit, well, I don't, he did it. Uh, but the coroner took the stand and said, well, no, the blows to her head had to have occurred before she was deceased. They figured that out. The prosecutors presented the case that Thomas Maimoni was infatuated with Martha, and he basically found a way to lure her onto his boat. I guess he told her, and maybe this is why uh, Brian didn't question the, the, the girlfriend slash wife thing, because I guess Thomas had told Martha that his wife died of cancer, so maybe Martha had told Brian that at some point, but that obviously wasn't true. Uh, his wife was alive, and at the time this all happened, she was in Kansas on a trip. But they had other women come forward as witnesses to state that he also tried to get these women to board his ship as well. One of the women actually got on the boat, and they said that once they were out far enough, he took off his clothes without asking or anything. And then another person said that she was grabbed inappropriately by him. However, uh, they were able to escape death. So Thomas Maimoni would be found guilty. The jury did not buy any of his bullshit and he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole. He was first eligible for parole in 2006 and he was denied. He tried again in 2011. He tried again in 2016 every single time he was denied. At one of his more recent parole hearings, he said that there was this big conspiracy, big cover up that, and Lori Cabot was like in on it, that she, there's no way she could have known these things. And like, so they must have set them up somehow. And obviously that, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, it's like that a witch slash psychic helps solve this case. His story somehow is, is, is this idea of a conspiracy sounded more far-fetched uh, than the story of the witch helping, you know, solve this and find the body. But every time he always said, I didn't do it, I didn't do it, I didn't kill her. But on October 18th, 2017, at the age of 72, Thomas Maimoni died in prison. He never got free. So he ended up paying for it with his own life. He was ultimately a predator. He was a pathological liar. 
He was a monster and he was just the guy next door. And there are many guys next door, probably just like him. And unfortunately, stories like this that happened to you know people like Martha Brailsford, these, these stories, as, as awful as they are, help kind of paint a more secure future for other women um, to know the things to look out for, things to not do. You just wish that people like Martha didn't have to die for this kind of you know, uh, I guess being aware of your surroundings stuff. Be very, very cautious, you know, when dealing with people, even if you think you know them, if they ask you to go somewhere alone with them, be cautious, tell everyone where you're going, give them who you're going with, who, where you're going, what the plan is, when you're supposed to be back, give them everything. Give them a picture of the person you're going with, take a picture of their license plate if you can and send it like, Always tell at least one person, if not many, all the details about whatever encounter you're about to have with someone, especially if you feel uncomfortable with that situation. Martha was a wonderful woman and she was such a, a bright ray of sunshine to everyone, it seems like. And she was just, she was trusting and there's nothing wrong with being trusting. Uh, it's not her fault what happened to her. You have, it's, it's him. It's the predator's fault. He took advantage of her being maybe a little naive and and her being trusting. But in the end, Martha, thanks to some police work and also thanks to which Martha Brailsford would end up getting the justice she rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, true crime, a Rooney Dooney Dingleberry Dongs. Hope you found it interesting. Like I said at the beginning, please subscribe here if you're into true crime, you big weirdos. And also follow me over on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook. All of that's linked in the link tree below skis. So yeah, uh, we will uh, see ya. We'll see ya. We'll see you for the next video on whatever the hell day that is. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what day am I filming this on? Who knows? It's in the past. It's in the right now. I'm talking from the past. Ooh. Oh, so stupid. You're so stupid. You're so stupid, Mike. You're so dumb. You're so dumb. No one believes you're talking from the past, even though technically I am talking from the past. Because when you watch this, this is being filmed in the past. This witch lady has gotten to me. She makes me think that I'm a psycho, psychic. It's not a psycho, psychic. <sighs> Once again, Mike, you have failed to do a proper goodbye. A sane goodbye. Once again, you have failed. Will you ever succeed, Mike? I don't know. Probably not, because you're sitting here talking to yourself. You're having a conversation with yourself. Beep, turn off. Okay. <laughs>